If you've never used a router before, then this video is for you. We'll be covering the absolute basics to help you feel more comfortable with routers, router accessories, and how to use them. Check it out. So, what can a router be used for? Routers are one of the most versatile tools in your arsenal and can be used for a wide variety of applications. Having a quick look around at just a single piece of furniture in my house, I can see a bunch of different features that were made using a router. We've got the round over on the top, raised panel drawer fronts, dovetail drawer boxes, raised frame and panel doors, molding for this little center bit, dados for the drawer dividers, and a profile on the baseboard, all made with a router. There are various different types of routers out there, and I'm gonna show you the three most common types. This is a quarter inch trim router and is designed to be used exclusively for doing trim profiles and light work. This one's a Katsu brand and is a nice cheap entry level model that's used by a lot of people getting started with routers. You can get battery powered ones, but this one is corded and I'd recommend getting a battery powered one if you can afford it though, as it gets rid of the cable, which can get in the way when, and can limit where you're working based on where your nearest plug socket is. This router is a very simple way of setting the depth. We just unclip this adjustment lever and slide it up and down to your required depth. In addition to this, it also comes with a more fixed base. This one, you can see I've attached to a piece of wood, which provides an offset base. So my workpiece is here and the base sits here. This is something I've made, but often when you purchase a router, it will come with an offset base or you can purchase the offset base separately. This next one is a quarter inch plunge router. The main difference between this and the trim router is the fact that you can actively plunge this one down to your preset depth while in operation. This is useful for cutting holes and grooves into the center of a piece of wood like this. This final router is a half inch plunge router. And as you can see, it's much more heavy duty. It works in very much the same way as the quarter inch plunge router, but has more power and can cut through thicker and denser material. It's worth noting that you can add a quarter inch collet to this router, but you can't add a half inch collet to the quarter inch routers that I showed you. Don't worry, I'll explain what a collet is in a minute. This is a collet. The collet is the thing that holds the router bit in place. I'll talk you through the router bit shortly, but collets come in various sizes. Most commonly, you'll find a quarter inch and a half inch, six millimeter, eight millimeter, and 12 millimeter. Depending where you are in the world, you'll either get the metric or imperial collets, and in general, in the UK and the USA, we commonly have imperial router bits, and therefore we want our routers to have the quarter inch and a half inch collets. You can tighten your collet in place by hand when not using it, so as not to lose it, but when you're not using the router, you should always remove the router bit and never over tighten the collet using the wrench. This could damage the collet and render it unusable. Most routers will have a variable speed setting and this tends to be shown in number format, such as one to five, with the speed increasing as the number increases. You can set the speed according to the size of the router bit you're using and your instruction manual will show what speeds you need to use. You'll also find that most routers will have a dust collection port for you to connect your shop vac to so that you can minimize the amount of dust. I'd recommend using this wherever possible as routers can make quite a lot of mess. But you might find that you need to play around with different vacuum hose attachments to find the right fit. Router bits are the things that actually do the cutting. There's a vast array of different router bits you can get, and I'm not gonna go through every single one of them because it will take up a lot of time. But I will go through the basics and the different types you tend to get in a beginner set like this. There are two main differences between router bits, non-bearing guided bits and bearing guided bits. A bearing guided bit has this bearing that runs along the top or the bottom of your bit and runs along the edge of your workpiece to give you your profile that you want. Most beginner set look very similar to this one. In this particular beginner set, you get a selection of straight bits, which can be used for cutting dados, grooves, housing joints, etc. using a straight edge to guide your router like this. Generally, you'll get a V-groove bit, which will unsurprisingly cut a V-groove, a cove bit, which will cut a cove. Uh, these are useful for decorations on the face of your workpiece, such as the groove I made in this drawer front or things like a juice groove on a chopping board. You'll also usually get a dovetail bit, which can be used in dovetail jigs and for cutting dovetail shaped grooves in your workpiece for slotting specific clamps in, for example. 
These are called flush trim bits, and this one has the bearing mounted at the bottom, which will run along a template underneath your workpiece, like this. And you can also get ones like this one, that has a bearing on the top so you can use a template on top of your workpiece like this. Flush trim router bits are fantastic for template work and flush trimming two pieces together. These ones are also bearing mounted and provide different edge profiles. The bearing runs along the edge of your workpiece and depending on how deep you set your bit, you'll get a variation of the shape shown. From a cove, Roman OG, round overs, and chamfer. All the bits are labelled, showing the bit size with the pattern that it's going to be doing. It's worth noting that on most bits, if you go too deep, you'll end up putting a lip on the edge of your workpiece like this. It can provide a nice effect if that's what you're going for, but you may also just be looking for a smooth edge like this. So it's worth bearing in mind and checking you haven't set it too deep if that's not the effect you're going for. To change your router bit, it's good practice to always make sure you're fully unplugged. Then you just need to loosen off the collet nut and put your bit in. I tend to make sure I insert the bit with some of the top still showing so that it's not tightening onto the painted part. Then you just need to tighten it up. Next you want to set the speed of your router based on the size of your router bit. But as a rule of thumb, the bigger the router bit, the slower the speed you'll want. You'll want to use hearing and eye protection when using the router as well and make sure you don't have any loose clothing such as hoodie strings as they can get caught up in the spinning bit if you're not careful and you're going to have a bad time. You'll want to make sure that your workpiece is securely held in place before using your router. Often you'll find that you need to adjust and move the clamps while routing your workpiece. It's important to note that this won't cause a problem as you can just pick up where you left off. You should always pay attention to the direction you're moving your router. The router bit spins clockwise and, as a general rule, you should be pushing the router away from you in an anti-clockwise direction. There's usually an arrow on your router to remind you of the direction. If you're working on the outside of your workpiece, then you should go anti-clockwise, but if you're working on the inside of a piece, as on the inside of a picture frame, your bit is then running on the other side and you need to go clockwise. If you go in the same direction the bit's spinning in, it's called a climb cut. This can be dangerous if you aren't ready for it, as it can pull the router away from you, but a climb cut can actually be helpful on certain applications. For example, you may wish to use a climb cut sparingly on corners to avoid chip out. Chip out is the term used to explain when the bit forces the wood to split or chip out on the ends, which can damage your overall finish. You'll want to get the router bit turning and fully up to speed before touching it to your workpiece, otherwise it could jerk out of your hand and potentially ruin the workpiece. Generally, I like to start with the ends and the corners to minimize the chip out and then run it along the rest of my piece. Wherever possible, I'd recommend testing your cut and depth settings on a scrap of the same wood rather than your final workpiece. This allows you to dial it all in and get used to it before taking it to your final workpiece. When using the router, you don't need to go too deep straight off as it can put unnecessary pressure on the router and the bit and could damage the workpiece. The best bet is to take multiple shallow passes until you reach your required depth or when the bearing touches the workpiece. If you're doing an edge profile, don't worry about the shape being different or messy on your first passes as it'll always settle down on each pass. If you're using the router on a narrow piece of wood such as this, you'll want to ensure that you have a stable base for your router. You'll therefore want to add another piece of wood the same thickness as your workpiece to give your router the stable base you need. Now, a little bit of burning on your wood is fairly common, particularly with cheaper router bits and you shouldn't worry too much. You do need to try and minimise this where possible and burn marks can usually be caused by a few things such as the router bit being a bit blunt, the speed setting being incorrect or too much pressure being applied. However, the main reason tends to be from not moving the router smoothly and quickly enough and staying in one place for too long, which is why it's important to move smoothly and confidently when routing your workpiece. When you're routing with a straight bit to get a straight groove within a piece of wood, you'll want to set up a straight edge to run your router against. If you've measured out the center of your line for where you want, your, want to route, then you'll need to measure from the center of your bit to the edge of your router and use this distance to set up your straight edge. Make sure the straight edge is clamped tightly and that your workpiece is also clamped tightly. If your router has a flat and a curved side like this one, you'll probably be thinking that the straight side is the right side to run against your straight edge. But you're actually better off using the curved edge as any small discrepancies in your movement will balance out whereas any small movements using your straight side may result in your line not being perfectly straight. 
Whenever you've finished with your router, it's a good practice to get into the habit of removing the router bit as it can get stuck in if you leave it there for too long. Once you've removed your bit, you can keep the collet loosely screwed in by hand, but remember you should never over tighten it without the bit in. Everything I've shown you today should give you a good base for starting out with a router. You can get more advanced as your skills and confidence grow. There's tons of applications, router bits and jigs you can use with your router, so don't be afraid to keep trying out different techniques. The methods I've shown you today are based on bringing the tool to the workpiece. The next step will be to set up a router table where you can bring the workpiece to the tool. There's some distinct advantages to doing this and having a router table set up. I'm planning on making a video about setting up and using a router table in due course. So don't forget to subscribe and you'll be notified when I do. I hope you found this video useful. And if you want to learn more about woodworking projects and tools, then you'll want to watch this video next. See you next time.